So here we go. Nice meditation. <laughs> what? Hot. Oh yes, I'm a very hot monk. That's why people like to take photographs of me. I'm a monk. I'm feeling warm. <laughs> I am warm with, <laughs> with the fire of the Dhamma, with kindness and compassion. No, I'm fine. She'll be right. So here we go. Deep meditation. Chilling out. So just be aware of your body first of all. Just sitting here. Mm. Just making peace, being kind, being gentle, first of all with your body. I look upon my body like a vehicle, like a car. Mine is a vintage car. And you have to look after it. Make sure it's well serviced. And for me to service my car, I just learn how to relax everything. Starting with my legs. Sitting here for a couple of hours. Or maybe an hour and a half or something. make sure they're as comfortable as possible. They'll never be perfect. But just just a bit of kindness, compassion, care towards them makes them feel so much better. Just like if ever you're a, a doctor or a nurse, you visit people in hospital, just the fact that you care. You go around and just talk to people. Just that makes such a difference. The same with my own parts of my body. I felt that I care for my legs, I don't take them for granted. <coughs> Means that my legs tell me what they need. So I've just adjusted them. Thank you, see the legs. That feels better. And then my butt. Sometimes I like a real high cushion under it, sometimes not. Now it just feels okay. Get my back all nice and s stretched. It's not doing that, just stretching, just like a, a dog. I wasn't a dog in my past life, but uh, I know that some Zen monk once told me that if you write a book, you have to spend the next seven lifetimes as a donkey. So I think I've got, how many donkey lives have I got left? Almost about 70, I think. <laughs> It's okay, I know how to catch carrots. So I stretch my back, move it around, get it nice and comfy. My hands, put them in a nice place. Shoulders, relax to the max. You know, I can feel those muscles in my shoulders. A little bit tense. You know them. You notice how to relax them. And when I relax them, it's this, this thing which the word let go describes. Letting go is just a word. And it describes this the attitude of my mind. This little switch which I turn on and all the muscles get released. Not squashed, not pulled, not stretched. Let go. After a while you understand what that word means. You learn on your own body what letting go is. It's that little command, if you call it command, but it's really a, a turning off tension. 
which your mindfulness gives you the feedback that things get loose, not pulled tight anymore. And then my neck. Neck is really good, it's not irritating because the irritation has gone up to my nose. And then your face, your head. Make sure it's all nice and relaxed as much as possible. Feel the whole body. And if there is one part which is more disturbing than others, focus on it. Get to know it, get to understand it. Know yourself, know your disease. A hundred illnesses face, a hundred illnesses cured. Adapted from the Chinese art of war. And once the body is relaxed, go to your peaceometer. Just like your body is stretched, sometimes it's wounded. Sometimes your body can be sick. That causes the stress, the inflammation, the pain. So similar with your mind. You've been wounded, injured, not healed yet. And maybe this moment, disappointed. These are all stresses of the mind. And we learn how to relax to the max in our mind. Disengaging from your past. Disentangling from fears of the future. And you feel your peaceometer start to move closer to peace. And peace is cool. Peace is joyful. Peace is where you can rest. Peace is where you don't have to change yourself and blame yourself. Peace is where you feel there's no faults in you. You're a tree in the forest, you belong as you are. You make peace with your past. You make peace with your future. You make peace with your moment called now. Just being here. Your peace on it. Down, down. And then, once you're peaceful, you can be aware of your breath or aware of whatever's there right in front of your mind right now. Almost like you're a passenger on Buddha air. You can't tell the captain to go fast, go this way or that way. You're taking your seat, sitting quietly, and just enjoying the insight entertainment system. Not in flight entertainment, insight entertainment. Seeing where this meditation leads. Making peace. Being kind, being gentle. 
this moment, whatever it is, most important in the whole world. Be with it. Let it be. It's not the sound that disturbs you. It's you who sometimes disturb the sound. If the mind wanders off, why? It's because you've been too hard on it, too demanding. Be more loving to your mind, more kind, treating your mind like a friend, someone you love hanging out with, not someone you tell what to do. Making peace, being kind, being gentle, turns whatever you're experiencing in this moment into a friend. Which means you're just here, enjoying the moments. I will now be quiet, another 20 minutes, 25 minutes, then I will start speaking again.
getting close to the end of the meditation again. How are you feeling? What worked and what didn't work? In meditation we understand the causes which lead to peace, comfort, relaxation. Once we understand those causes, we focus on those causes, and peace comes. I'm now ring the gong three times. We did have a couple of questions in the they put in the bell. So we'll just have a look at those first and then we can do our concluding comments. Uh, dear Arjun <coughs> Brown, I'm used to th I used to think meditation as a repetition of some words or s sentences. It is a different kind of med is it a different kind of meditation? Or is it unnecessary? Thank you. Okay. Repetition of words or sentences can be a useful tool. It can be as part of the meditation. We call these mantras. So in the Thai tradition, the fourth tradition, we used to do the mantra Buddha, Buddha with the breath. Bidding in, say Bud, bidding out, To, Buddha, Buddha. That meant a lot to people who were brought up in that culture. When I started teaching that in Australia, it didn't work that much. So I tried another method. So when you breathe in, you say to yourself, shut. You breathe out, up. Shut, up. Shut, up. <laughs> it worked for a while, but people started laughing. So that didn't help. So that's why I did the uh, breathing in peace without let go. That seemed to be what I settled on. That's only for a part of the meditation, because after a while you don't need to say the words anymore. So in a different uh, levels of meditation, not levels in the sense of you're trying to sort of uh, get to the next level, like in a computer game, it's just uh, as you develop meditation, you, you get more refined. So you start by watching your body, then maybe pisometer, then watching your breath. But then, just like the different vehicles you used to get here, I went in an aircraft to get to uh, Melbourne Airport, then a car to get here, and then got out of the car and walked with my shoes on to get to the, the monk's quarters, then took my shoes off to walk barefoot to go the rest of the way. Different vehicles for different parts of the journey. Unfortunately, I couldn't, learn, I couldn't land the aircraft in the car park of the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Unfortunately, they had a big tent in there. <laughs> so the point is, different parts of meditation, different tools for different stages. So the, where we do the, um, uh, the watching, sort of the, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, saying mantras, that's a different, a certain part of the meditation. You're doing the mantras, whatever it is, say Buddha, Buddha. When the mind gets peaceful, you don't need the words anymore. You can't park the car in your room in the monk's quarters. You have to leave it outside. It can only go so far. So you start with, say, a mantra, then mantra disappears. You're just with the breath, breathing in, breathing out. And the breath can take you so far. And then you get limiters, beautiful lights. When you have a light in the mind, you don't need the breath anymore. It's done its job. Now you just have this beautiful light in the mind. And then you use the light as far as it can take you to the entrance of the jhanas, and then you're in the jhana realm. So every one of these little vehicles has a usage. And there comes a time when you have to let go of that vehicle. You know, this is very similar 
to the Buddha's simile of the raft. Only the Buddha just mentioned the raft is to go across one stretch of water. You use the raft to go across, but once you go across the reach the other side, you don't take the raft with you. You have to go by foot when you go to the other side. So every vehicle has its usage, has its time. Even breath meditation, the breath can only take you so far. You let the breath go and you get on the next vehicle. That's the way this meditation works. Okay. Dear Arjun Brahm, I have heard you mentioning that in deep meditation EEC or ECG could become flat. This, I believe, can be interpreted as there is no blood flow. When someone travels for long hours in a plane without moving, it is said that the possibilities of having deep vein thrombosis are very high. In deep meditation, there is no movement of the physical body. So shouldn't this be a concern? Ooh. Would you like to comment on this? No, don't get worried about those things. Because what happens is, the, in deep meditation, the, there's no... Even Ajahn Chah's story. That, uh, when Ajahn Chah had his stroke, and uh, you know, couldn't speak, he was still meditating, we know that, because sometimes he stopped breathing. And for a long time, hours, he didn't die. Because on one occasion, the doctor was really scared, or rather the nurse, male nurse on duty, was really scared. He's not breathing. And the monk said, oh, he does it all the time, just leave him alone. <laughs> and so the doctor was like, and the male nurse was arguing, and so they decided to take blood samples every few minutes to make sure the blood was well oxygenated. It didn't matter, as long as there was oxygen in the blood, it didn't matter whether you're breathing or not. And they found all this time when Hajan Cha wasn't breathing, still his oxygen levels in his blood remained constant. I wish that would have been reported and you know, done under some sort of conditions that would, would actually prove that this was not a fake. He wasn't breathing. It was still uh, blood was going, heart was still going. But in the deeper meditations, even there, the heart stops. There's no, there's no thing going through. It's really weird. But you're not dead. And apparently, there's some, some Hindu yogis have done that under laboratory conditions. And sometimes that we we wonder that's impossible, but that is the arrogance of science thinking that they know and things which they can't make any sense of cannot exist. As I said, it's the same thing with when you have a, uh, the flower pot experiment, which I mentioned a few days ago. When that lifts them from the table, the scientists in Imperial College London, they thought that this can't be happening. It's not true. It was true. Even some of the other things which Emeritus professor, Professor Bernard Carr, a uh, very close student to uh, Professor Stephen Hawkins, great friend, Buddhist, first Buddhist I ever met, also a uh, theoretical physicist, and also a, uh, a member of the Psyche Research Society. You know, just in conversations with him, he said he's taken these professors, top experimenters, great scientists, you know, to mediums, who could do the you know, lifting the tables? This was not a trick. The table was lifting up the air. And the scientists were free, having a look underneath, checking everything, seeing uh, how can this you know, be happening? And I remember him telling me, this scientist turned to him and said, This can't be happening. This can't be happening. This is some sort of I'm being deluded, I'm being drugged or something. And anything but admit the evidence right before their eyes. So when you get a doctor, saying, this person, the brain is not functioning. There's no blood flow. But, nothing is happening. They're still alive. They come out afterwards without any damage whatsoever. Weird, but true. This is one of the things why I liked science, the interaction between real science and meditation. Because real science, even if you can't understand what's happening, the evidence has to take priority. 
little things like quantum entanglement. You know, you've heard that word. It's true. They've tested it out. It's a phenomena which is real. But no one understands what the heck's going on or why it works. Just like some of these other things in meditation. Why? According to our understanding, it shouldn't happen, but it does. Which means that our understanding needs to be changed rather than the evidence canned. One of those little phenomena which I love bringing up at this junction was Professor John Lorber. In 1981, a long time ago, Sheffield University. His field of research was the shape of human skulls and whether that affected one's health and longevity and social interaction. So whenever he saw anyone on campus who had a slightly deformed skull, he would invite them on the program. He saw this young graduate student in mathematics and uh, he's perfectly socially um, normal, girlfriend, ordinary guy, only his skull shape was slightly out of the ordinary. We gave him a CT scan, and the CT scan showed he had no brain. It's just uh, the cerebral fluid in there, intracranial fluid. That was all. And think one percent, just a sheaf of cortex on the outside, no amygdala, no other than this so whatever. No way in the world should he be alive, let alone be a genius at mathematics with a girlfriend, emotionally stable. And Professor Lorber just wrote this article, The Boy with No Brain. It wasn't a, a mistake of the machines, they did it a couple of times, but it was just too difficult to accept. So it was just put in anomaly. Couldn't have happened, but it did happen. The boy with no brain. A (laughs) no-brainer. But it was, it was actually there. I I got the article back over in in Bodhinyana Monastery and just... That challenges. It shouldn't happen, but it does. So those are the sorts of things I really love, what meditation does, gets in all this information. So anyway, that's what happens. So, yeah, you no, no, uh, the brain is dead. The uh, no ECG, heart's not pumping. But fully conscious, and you're very safe also because even in the suttas, the teachings of the Buddha, there was this monk, and he was meditating in the jungle, and his two villagers were going hunting for mushrooms or something, and they saw this monk sitting perfectly still in the jungle. Really still, and they thought, he's dead. They checked, no breath, no pulse. So, what can you do with, you know, you're a Buddhist, you know, you, you just respect the Sangha, you see a monk there dead, what should we do now? I think, well, you know, just, if we leave him here, he'll get eaten by the animals. That's not respectful, we can't take him back to the monastery, it's too far, so let's cremate him here. So, you know, in the forest, you've got wood everywhere, so they got some wood, only took an half an hour, an hour, and they put the monk on top of the wood, they did some sort of chanting, whatever they could remember, lit the, lit the wood, and then, once the fire was going, monk on top, so, you know, fire would do the rest, they're busy people. So they left, and the following morning, they were really impressed when that monk walked into the village for alms food. Uh, Not even his robe was burnt. So that's what happens. So if it does happen that maybe uh, Ayasuki gets into a deep meditation, thinks she's dead, and you take her to the local crematorium, put her in a box, they put her in there and turn on the gas and it gets really hot, and then what would happen afterwards? Once they sort of uh, opened up the oven to get the ashes out, hi, me again. (laughs) She'd still be okay with her robe, everything. Weird, but true. Anyway, I'm going on for a long time with those sorts of stories and I'm supposed to be finishing in a couple of minutes, so Uh, quick. Yeah, one one more. 
When the fifth sense disappears, <coughs> the mind is not connected to the body. Is that why the person you mentioned didn't know what happened to his body in the ambulance and in the hospital? Yeah, exactly, yeah. He wasn't aware of his body. He was just in a beautiful realm of the mind. I asked him, he said, the most wonderful experience of his life. Were you unconscious? No, really conscious, fully aware. Blissed out in the deep meditation. That's what happens. So the five senses can't reach you. But the major thing is you're perfectly safe. You can't be harmed. Anyway, there we go. Do you want to say any more or will I thank you? Uh, that's enough for now. <laughs> oh, it, one of my favorite words is discombobulated. <laughs> and I think you've been discombobulated enough, which means totally confused, astounded, amazed, I hope. But these things are true. Um, however, I still will thank you formally. Um, so, on behalf of the, the whole of the BSV community, thank you, Ajahn, so much for coming, with, for being with us for the last four days. Well, I didn't have anything else to do, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, for showing us the AFL way, for sharing how to be kind to our bodies, the simile of putting down the cup in stillness, uh, how to let go and how to get lost. Um, and, and I guess most of all for your energised energized self and for your sense of um, fun and disrespect and all the <laughs> other things that, <laughs> that, um, that people come back each year to, to, to... That's why we get so many people coming back to, to listen to you and to yeah. um, be, be with you each year. So... Um, We'll look forward to seeing you at some time next year. Yeah, okay, yeah, great. Catch up with you, mate.